This is one of our every other month events where we do a public education series for Parkinson's patients. Today, um, we're going to be talking about caregivers. Um, as you may or may not know, April is Parkinson's Awareness Month. And one of the things we think we should bring more awareness to during this month is the caregiver. It's something um, you won't hear a lot uh, talked about or not nearly enough talked about. So to the Institute, we've recently got a new ch uh, Chief Operating Officer that I'd like to introduce. And he's helping us run things around here. And I'd just like you to see one of the new faces around here, uh, Mr. Clyde Taylor. Thank, thank you. Um, just wanted to welcome you to the Institute. Uh, one of the missions of the Institute is compassionate care for people with Parkinson's while the Institute strives to uh, attack the disease at its source, find its cause and w ways to cure it. Uh, seminars like these in the clinic downstairs are made possible by generous donations from supporters of the Institute. Uh, it's the only way we, we stay around and are able to provide these services. So anyway, I hope you benefit from today's presentation. I know it will be excellent as usual. And if you have any questions, we have staff in the back. Uh, feel free to talk to them when this is over. Maria? All right, thank you, Clyde. Well, let's go ahead and get started. We've got our first speaker coming up. If you have never seen him before, his name is Brandon Nguyen. And he's our medical social worker here on staff. He's here part time. He um, is a licensed social worker and counselor. He does a wonderful class here, a couple support group. And that's a small group where they get couples and he's able to talk to them um, over a series of classes. So it's something you commit to, is it eight weeks? Ongoing. Um, to learning how to communicate with your partner when you're dealing with this. And he's got a lot of coping strategies, a lot of tips, um, and a lot of ways for you to learn how to talk to each other. So without further ado, I will go ahead and get Brandon's. Um, talk going. Welcome, Brandon Nguyen. Thank you very much, uh, Maria, for your generous introduction. The truth is um, I have the pleasure of uh, serving in the position of a clinical social worker here. Uh, this is into my third year. I'm part-time. The institution has been very generous. Um, uh, it wants, they want me to provide more hours and services, but unfortunately, my uh, home setting is in South San Jose, and it doesn't um, enable me to uh, provide more services here. But the reason I really um, have uh, uh, been here for, lo for this long and I want to uh, continue the work that I'm doing here is simply because I have so much admirations for the patients and the families that ha I have the pleasure to uh, work with. And uh, throughout my experience, I've learned so much from families, from uh, the patients, and um, there's just so much that we need to learn uh, from the provider side in order to be more effective in partnering with you to overcome this illness and get the best quality of life that you deserve. So my short talk today is about the subject of caregivers, and um, the title is uh, Credos of Caregivers. But before I start, let me uh, just recap a little bit about the cost of the Parkinson's disease. And this is some rough statistic coming out from the National Parkinson's Foundation. To date, approximately 1 to 1.5 million Parkinson's disease sufferers are accounted in the United States. And the cost for treatment and care is roughly about $5.6 billion annually. And it is estimated that up to $20 billion worth in paid and unpaid caregiver cost per year. So that's the economic uh, impact of Parkinson's disease. What about the emotional and spiritual and relationship tolls on Parkinson's disease and caregivers? It is known that the caregivers of Parkinson's disease have a much higher rate of depression and physical ailment, ailments than other caregivers of other types of diseases. I heard something like twice as many or three times as many, it's not sure, but certainly significantly higher for caregivers of Parkinson's disease. And some of the reason is because the care usually takes place at home rather than institutions such as nursing home or hospitals. Care is for so-called impaired normal functionings and not the disease. You know, the disease itself, it just, it is what it is. But the symptoms that it causes that impair the normal functioning is what um, the caregiving is for. 
part of the stress of the uh, on the caregivers is trying to prevent the un unpreventable, such as falls. Now, how can you possibly prevent something like that? But that's what caregivers are so-called expected of themselves to prevent. And of course, there is the issue of increasing isolation, loss of control, and loss of income. You know, as time progresses. So that's the subject of the caregivers, but let me talk a little bit about the definition and the meaning of caregivers so that we can be a little bit more precise. The conventional concept of a caregiver, it refers to the non-symptom bearing family member. So you have a spouse, a, a, a couple, one person with Parkinson's and one does not have Parkinson's disease. The, the person without the Parkinson's disease is considered to be the caregivers. This is the conventional concept. And when we talk about caregivers, we usually mean the uh, physical aspect of the care, right? So, so the, one, the person that provides the physical care to the other person is the caregiver. And this concept of a caregiver also implies that the family member with the Parkinson's is the one with a problem or has little to contribute, right? That person is a care receiver. And it assumes that the caregiver has to be uniquely resourceful and capable. You know, so the concept of caregivers, it um, has those implied connotations to it. This particular concept of a caregiver works well when it applies to a paid care, pay caregiver situations or when the person with a Parkinson's is wholly incapacitated. So that's the concept of a caregiver, but this is the reality. In couples or in families, they are family members before they become caregivers and care receivers. So being family members, they are mutual caregivers. They take care of each other and not necessarily one way. So let me introduce the concept of a mutual caregiver. In this concept, both the symptom bearer and the non-symptom bearer are mutual caregivers and care receivers. Okay, and care is broadly defined as physical, emotional, or spiritual support of one another. And this applies to family caregiving because people are family members first. And in this particular concept, it stresses that both sides, both the persons with the Parkinson's disease and the one without, have a reciprocal responsibility to give and receive care for one another. So let's talk about the uh, task of mutual caregiving. There's obviously the physical and organizational component involving things like assistance with dressing, driving, money management, appointments, and things like that. This task falls on the family member that does not have the disease, right? And this task becoming increasingly more difficult as the disease progresses. There's also the mental emotional support, social, sexual, entertaining, advising, planning activities that can be shared. And then there's a spiritual components. And the spiritual component here, what I mean is setting good examples, role modeling, teaching, or just walking the hero's journey. And what I mean by this is time and time again, the uh, person who has the Parkinson's disease um, is a tremendous role model and setting an example for other people on how to deal with difficulties in life. And that has a tremendous uh, value to uh, younger folks or people who um, don't have the disease. And that's what I mean by walking the hero's journey. So it would look at a situation where in a family there are two individuals, um, usually in a, in a uh, spouse situation or um, an um, adult child taking care of a parent. Um, I think it is more helpful to look at that situation as a mutual caregiver rather than a singular uh, a conventional caregiver. And what are some of the credos or some of the rules that could make this relationship? So I think that some of the uh, uh, credos of uh, being mutual caregivers in a situation where one person has Parkinson's disease, um, the first thing is to realize that there's a choice. Now, oftentimes, as a family member, we feel, or you might feel, that we don't have a choice in terms of taking care of our loved ones. You know, and that 
it's very, very often it feels like it's that's the case. But having been um, uh, having had enough contact with uh, within our families, um, I realized that it is really a choice for somebody to be in the role of taking care of a family member. Because I also see many families, in many families, there are so many ways that one family member could get away from that responsibility. You know, there are so many reasons and excuses and things that a person can stay away from being the physical, emotional, or spiritual support to another family member. So for whatever reason that a family member stays in the relationships and assume the huge task of walking the journey with um, a, uh, a person with Parkinson's, it is really a choice. Somewhere down in your heart there is a choice. And it's important to recognize that, you know, so that you can take ownership of that and perhaps um, lessen some of the um, some of the undesirable uh, reactions, for example, anger. It is quite normal as a so-called caregivers to feel angry because you feel like you don't have a choice, you know, but to be reminded there is a choice in it can help. But uh, being a choice is almost, it's also a way that um, other uh, people can honor the person who makes this choice to, uh, to join uh, the persons with the Parkinson's uh, disease. So the um, idea of a choice is the idea that um, the uh, family member choose to be in this relationship and it is that person's responsibility um, to make it as satisfying and meaningful as possible. You know, that's the choice that a person makes. The other um, credos is individuality, and it says that my loved one and I walk the same path, but in different shoes. Um, we cannot compare the burden, but we can only be the best companion that we know how. Because um, living with a disease, um, it is almost impossible to kind of compare and gauge how the other person might feel. You know, who has the heavier burden here? It's kind of hard to tell. The persons with a Parkinson's um, have incredible amount of stress upon him or her. But so is the other person. You know, the one that is so-called the caregiving. It's very hard to compare apples and oranges. You know, so the way to think of this is two people walking the same path, dealing with the same struggles, but in very different shoes. And it's not possible to trade shoes, and, and, um, and, uh, and we cannot make a judgment in terms of who has a more difficult one to fit. The other is, uh, credos is self-care, and it says that I'm responsible for my own needs, and also for my unmet needs. And for whatever I cannot provide for myself, I will freely ask and allow my loved ones to freely give. And this applies to both individuals, because both persons have needs, and also unmet needs. And the other person may or may not be able to provide in a way that you need or in a timely manner. And there may or may not be a solution, but I think it's important to acknowledge this, you know. Uh, otherwise, there would be a situation where like one spouse says jump and the other one says how high, you know. And um, it may not be the most healthy situations to, uh, um, to be a part of the lifestyles. Okay, the other credos um, that I think is important is the concept of community, and that means that you live in a community with many mutual caregivers. So usually in a family there is like one person, and then one person is a caregiver. Um, but then there's others who's out there that can also join your community. Um, so it's important to ask and receive for what is needed from the community and invite others to join. You know, so if there's other friends and other uh, adult children, you know, invite them in. Ask them to take part into your life. The next thing is separation, and this is a difficult one to talk about. And separating is a part of any relationship. There's transient and temporary separation. Um, all persons in a relationship have to have time away to take care of themselves. Um, and this is very, very important because many times the caregiving family members is not able to 
walk away, even for a short amount of time. You know, when they break away, their mind is still back home in a relation you know, with what, whatever that needs to, that's waiting for them. And mentally, they cannot break away. And it's important to be able to break away. Um, longer separation may be necessary because of medical needs. You know, sometimes you have to be institutionalized for a short period of time. And the ultimate separation is death. So planning and accepting for these types of separations are a sign of healthy relationships. So I'm going to talk about obstacles here. So um, within the caregiving relationship, there's a lot of fear that are often unspoken. You know, fear of being abandoned, fear of suffering, fear of being an outcast to the community. And there's a lot of guilt and jealousy and envy that can interfere in the relationship, you know, because one person looks at the other uh, spouse is, um, is um, uh, the other person is being more capable. Um, so there's some uh, envy, enviness involved. Or looking at other people, other couples, other families who don't have the same problems. So then jealousy and envy can arise. Limited support from others. Uh, there's no secondary caregivers. I think that in any situation of chronically, um, with a, uh, having a person with uh, chronic illness, it's important to have a secondary, even a tertiary caregiver, you know, who looks in. If you have a situation where there's only one person with a disease and one person who is the so-called primary caregiver, it's not necessarily a sustainable situation because um, it's, uh, uh, to, to deal with this illness, you know, everybody has needs. So for couples, um, there would be an issue of insufficient intimacy as the disease progresses. And for a parent-child relationship, there could be a feeling of excessive obligations um, that would interfere in, um, in, uh, in the relationship. And then, of course, there's always that perpetual problem of self-esteem and unsatisfied legacy that you're not you know, doing enough or achieving enough, enjoying enough in your life. And there's that sense of nagging, loss. Uh, lack of long-term, long-range planning, uh, teamwork, uh, thinking that there's no solutions. And uh, this is hopefully, this is something that we can change um, is, uh, is on the part of the Parkinson's Institute. Um, because there are solutions, um, there are resources that we can together make happen. So here are some advice. Um, the first one is having family meetings on uh, specific care issues. Um, family meetings is very, very important uh, in my view, you know. Um, uh, and uh, they can uh, be organized from time to time in order to discuss uh, many issues that are present and also the, in the long term. Utilizing counseling for personal care and what I call as relationship tune-ups. It's uh, to, to, to be able to just um, see a professional counselor and talk about what's going on in relationships uh, can be very helpful, even though there might not be an obvious solution. Uh, but to be on the same page about how the family is and what are the individual needs and unmet needs um, can go a long way in terms of feeling like um, like uh, uh, the, uh, the the family can can is able to continue on to this difficult journey. And one resource that I'd like to share with you is simply this website uh, www.counselingcalifornia.org, and this is. Uh, the um, website for uh, marriage and family therapist, and uh, you can look under um, uh, look for individuals who have experience with elder care, for example, and then you can call them up and uh, get appointments with them. And the other thing is a joint care related community, whether that's a church or uh, the uh, uh, Parkinson's patient support group, a senior center uh, to join a community is. Uh, very important as well. I know that it's sometimes very difficult to break away or to have time for these uh, activities, but uh, to the extent that you're able to arrange for that, um, it generally would be very, very helpful. And there are free professional services out there. Um, there are guys that are under the names of uh, palliative care or legal social services. Uh, they are available for long-range planning. There may be information that would be helpful for you, but you're not aware of it. So just to make an appointment, sit down and find out what information these services, um, these agencies have uh, for you to be aware of, and then you can come back and have a more extended discussion with them later. Uh, that would be a very good thing as well. So to contact me, um, you can call the Parkinson's Institute, the general number, and I'm also leaving my uh, email uh, 
address here as well. Um, I help to facilitate a couple support group every third Tuesdays of the month from 2 to 4. So our next meeting is going to be next Tuesday. And I'm also available for individual and couple consultations. Uh, phone consultations are also available on Tuesday afternoon. And that's it. Thank you very much for your attention. Um, so next up, looks like we've got Christina Irving is going to be coming. And she's with Family Caregiver Alliance. If you've never heard of Family Caregiver Alliance, they're exactly what they sound like. They're a group that, that um, has resources and services that are available for those out there um, with families who are providing care for someone. So without further ado, I've got Christina. Thank you. I'm going to be speaking just very briefly. Um, as Maria mentioned, Family Caregiver Alliance is a nonprofit. It's been around about 30 years that works with family caregivers for, for support and advocacy. How's that? Okay. okay. Um, so really what we do is provide information and support for families, help them figure out what resources and services are available to the community so that you can care for yourselves as well as loved ones. And we work with people, um, families of someone who has Parkinson's and Alzheimer's and other dementias and stroke and lots of different things. We really encourage families to start looking at resources and support early. A lot of people will say, well, we're managing, we're doing okay right now down the road when we need help then we'll start looking into services. The sooner families start getting help and support for themselves, the more effective that's gonna be than waiting until you are completely overwhelmed and burned out and tired and, and confused about where to go and where to start. It's a lot harder to build up your resilience at that point. And Parkinson's disease, like several others, they're long-term, they're chronic conditions. I think Maria mentioned that the caregiver who's speaking next was a caregiver for 16 years. That's basically a marathon, so we don't want to put all of our energy into a quick burst at the end. It's building up your ability to cope with this, this disease, building up your own resilience, and finding out what do you need for yourself to help take care of you, as well as be there for support for your loved one. Um, so we do free and home consultations with families to talk about what's available in the community. What are the resources? How do you get support for yourself? How do you get breaks, even if those are really just you know, 10, 15 minute breaks every day, time that's just for you, because you each are gonna need that. What do you need for yourself to get through this long-term disease and this, these long-term conditions? So it's something, again, we really encourage families to start looking earlier than you think you need it, because it's easier to look at all the different options, what's out there, what's available, when you're earlier on in the disease process than as you go on and you really start needing help. Um, so I have lots of information, I have a table in the back about our resources, about some other community resources for, for families that are available in Santa Clara and San Mateo County. I know there's some people coming from farther away. We definitely can connect you with resources in those areas as well. Um, but again, it's all about figuring out how are you going to get through this when it can be 10, 15, even 20 years um, that you both are going to be having to deal with with Parkinson's and how are you going to cope with it? And that's really kind of our goal is to help families be able to do that. That's it. All right, thank you. All right well, thank you, Christina. Okay, up next we have um, a caregiver perspective from Parkinson's. And we have Vivian Franklin speaking, who um, works as a local principal and, as we mentioned, has been a caregiver for 16 years and has a lot of tips and perspective um, for how to go on this journey. So, welcome, Vivian. Good afternoon. Uh, first of all, I'd like to know how many of you are caregivers? If you can put your hand up. Okay, and how many of you are um, people with Parkinson's? Okay, good, it's about a mixture. How many of you are here just for the fun talk? <laughs> Great! <laughs> Well, I think the thing you have to have as you're being a caretaker is a sense of humor. And also, as a person with Parkinson's, to have a sense of humor. Because you got it. I mean, you got to deal with it. And the best way to approach it is facing it. And sometimes we have to laugh at ourselves. I am Vivian Franklin. And Christina earlier said that I was a caregiver for 16 years. Bill, I still am. You're still here. <laughs> and. And uh, she says, you know, it could be up to 20 years. Bill, it'll be to 25 to 35 years. So, 
you got a long ways yet, don't worry. Um, I was asked to give my story as a, a caregiver and what I've learned and some of the tips that I can share with you. Um, first of all, I am still learning because as Parkinson's progresses, there are still more things that come up. And just when you think you've got it, something else comes up. My story is as a married couple, but I hope that those of you who are here, not as a couple, but as uh, another kind of relationship, can gather something from what I have to share. I remember about 25 years ago, it was, well, it was not 25 years ago, on our 25th wedding anniversary, we were driving up to Napa Valley, and at that time, we thought that he might have Parkinson's, and we thought, okay, you know, we love each other, we'll deal with it, it's fine. Looking back at it, it's sort of like when you first get married, you know how you're set, you're told, okay, it's going to be hard work, and you think, uh-huh, but when I get married, we love each other, it's going to be fine. Now, after 40 years of marriage, it's a lot of work. Marriage, that is. It's a lot of work. And the same with being a caregiver and working as a couple with Parkinson's in the family. So it is a lot of work, but it absolutely is doable. Um, we have found that when we first learned about it, it was something that we thought, okay, we're going to have to uh, handle this. But after over 16 years, it's more like managing it, massaging it, mastering it, uh, cursing it, blessing it, and releasing it. So there's a whole lot of emotions that go through in, in working with Parkinson's. So I think the uh, most difficult time for me was when uh, Bill wanted to keep it a secret. Oh, and by the way, I've passed all these notes by Bill and he approves of this speech. So, <laughs> um, he wanted to keep it secret. So for a couple of years, I couldn't talk to anybody. The family members knew about it, but they weren't much help because they had their own issues to deal with. We didn't even tell our two sons, who were teenagers at that time. But it just got to a point, it was just overbearing for me. I needed somebody to talk to. I ended up calling Parkinson's Institute. There was a, I don't remember who it was, but a lovely lady that uh, referred me to a support group leader. And I called her, I had broken down, sobbing, and it was just wonderful to listen to somebody else who is walking my same path, or at least had walked it, and is at a different stage and could give me guidance. That began our, um, our trip along this pathway of a more positive, proactive um, direction in dealing with Parkinson's. I finally convinced Bill to go to a Parkinson's Institute conference where he could learn more about Parkinson's. He really didn't want to go, he was in denial. He said, let's take two cars so that if I want to leave, I can leave and you can still stay there and get the information. Well, he stayed for the whole thing. And from that point on, he became very active in Parkinson's Action Network, which is back east in Washington, D.C. He has taken, um, he's traveled about 10 times over the 10 years to the forum that they put on there. So I've been very fortunate to be married to somebody who tries to look at the positive side and wanted to try and make a difference with his disease. Now, it's not saying that everything's been rosy. We have a lots of times when we may be yelling at each other, and it's not pleasant, but it's sometimes like that in a marriage without Parkinson's. So, you know, every marriage has their ups and downs, and we do too. Um, I want to give you some of the tricks, tricks that uh, I have learned over these years. The first problem that came up with Bill was his vision. He had double vision from taking the medications. We went to several doctors and we finally found that there is a way to help with the double vision and that's using prisms in the glasses. It was, a, it was interesting, you really have to search around for some doctors because the doctors we first went to were recommended that they knew all about Parkinson's and they said there was nothing you can do. And we went to somebody else and they said yes there is and the prisons helped. It was really tiring after a while driving in the car with Bill going like this. Trying to decide whether he had double vision or what was going on. So um, that helped a lot. Now, one of the other problems was he, has, he needs to wear glasses for close-up and for distance. Well, when he's trying to find his glasses, whether they're for reading or for distance, it was a pain because he couldn't see them. He needs his reading glasses in order to check his glasses out. 
So what I finally did is I color-coded them. I used fingernail polish, and on his reading glasses, I painted red. They're on the tips. He's wearing a pair, so if later on you want to check them out. He's my visual aid, so you'll be able to check them out later. Um, painted it red for close-up, and then blue on the ones for distance, like the sky. That helped me, too, because there are many times I needed to find his glasses, and then I couldn't tell. I'd have to put them on to see which ones they were. So now that they were color-coded, it was easy. We also used uh, cases that were color-coded, yellow for close-up and uh, black or blue, and I'd write on them, whether they're reading glasses or distance. Um, another problem has been cell phones. Cell phones are wonderful, but if you don't have fine motor skills, and you don't have the, the vision. So he has a cell phone, but he doesn't have his close-up glasses on. Now you know there's a little red button and a little green button and there's the menu button, but they're not big enough. So I put stickers on them, a red one for the stop the call, a blue one for um, answering it, or green, I forget what color it is, and then a yellow, a bigger one for um, the menu section of it. Another thing with phones, you know how um, the phone can ring and it's kind of hard to get to it. So we ended up purchasing six portable phones and they're around lots of different areas where Bill is. So it's a lot easier for him to reach the phones. The only downside of this is in the evening, where are all the phones? <laughs> so I have to walk around and gather them all and put them all back in their stations. Exercise is really important. And Bill and I love to walk and we've walked for years. We love walking in Deer Hollow at uh, Rancho San Antonio. Um, we, we bought walking sticks for him a couple of, um, oh, several years ago and that has helped him with his balance. Cell phones also really come in handy. Not that you can use them, but one time, make sure you take your medications when you're walking. We forgot his pills and he froze and we were up in the hills. We were the last ones there and it was dark. And I pulled out the cell phone and used it as a flashlight. So that's another handy thing for cell phones. Um, he wears knee pads when he goes walking. So when he falls, because he does have some weak knees, when he falls, the knees are padded. You know, we talked about just this the other day, we love walking so much but it was a little difficult and I said, you know, maybe we'll just get um, a wheelchair and I'll just push you. The advantage of that is I don't have to tell him, come on, walk faster, walk faster. I could go at my own pace, I'll get my upper arm exercise and I'll get my cardiac going and he'll be outside enjoying the company, I hope, with me and um, the beauty. So it's constantly having to be flexible and think what are some ways you can make the changes so that you can still have those joys in life. Cane has you, Bill uses two canes. I'm not sure why he likes to use two. It's kind of more like a security blanket, but he uses two canes. Problem is that we've lost them. And uh, so we get to a store, he puts them in the cart. He likes pushing the cart. We get back to the car, unload it, and the canes are left in the cart. So now on our canes, we put, we have our phone number on them in case they're placed somewhere. But we also have several canes, so they're in different places of the house, so it's easily accessible so when we need to leave. I also have one nice pair, so when we go out, which he's using today, because the other ones get really beaten up, but when we're going out for the evening or going to somebody's house, I don't want the beaten up ones, so he's got a nice pair that he uses. That just makes it easier for me, so I don't run around trying to find which one matches with which. Shoes. Yes, we do walk in a different path, with different shoes. I wear the normal shoes. Bill likes to wear Velcro shoes. And uh, we find the Velcro shoes are much um, more handy for him. Although he still likes to wear some of the regular shoes. But now instead of going shopping, I try to do some of it online. Because going shopping can be a task. It can be challenging. And so we find the shoes he likes. I just go on Zappos. I order the shoes again. and. and it's just a whole lot easier. He wears a fanny pack when he goes out. We have found that at times his wallet will slip out of his pocket, uh, pocket and he's not aware of it. So now there's a fanny pack where he keeps everything in there. I've also put an X at the top of it because sometimes his visual awareness isn't so sharp and so he might put it on upside down. But with the X, he can see it and it's up there for him to see. 
medication. We struggled with this a number of years ago because he wants to remain independent as, possi as much as possible, but it got to the point where him doing the pills just was problematic. So he finally agreed that I would, I would do the pills for him. Well, then I was doing them every night, and then I'd forget, and then I was tired. So now I do the pills, I try to do 30 days worth. In each pill container, I actually have the weekly container, but then I label it wake up, 9 o'clock, 12 o'clock, 3 o'clock, 6 o'clock, 9 o'clock, bedtime. And so he has those pills to use, that, those containers. Um, also learn to keep a medication list on me. You know, I thought, that's okay, it's Cinnamon and Mirapax, and there's something else he takes. Well, he had an accident water skiing a couple years ago. He broke his sternum. At first we thought it was a heart attack. We were out in the middle of Lake San Antonio, down south, away from everywhere. And um, all the responders, and there were about 13 of them, kept asking what are the medications. They asked him and they asked me. I didn't know and I had to go back to the cabin. So now I, I keep a list in my wallet, all the medications and all the doctors' names and phone numbers on there. The only, uh, the only sense of humor that came out that day is that Bill finally said to one of the responders, why don't you just tape record me? And then as each of these other guys come, just play the tape record for me so that he didn't have to constantly talk about it. We had another emergency this last, a year ago when my son had um, um, a ruptured appendix and it was pretty serious. And so we had to grab things and get up to Sacramento to see him. Trying to grab all the stuff for Bill was just, it was overwhelming. So I learned from that to have a toiletry bag. Yes, we have them for traveling, but I wanted everything in there. I, I bought a brand new razor, I bought um, nose clippers, everything, so that when I leave, I've got everything he needs there. The only thing I need to take are his canes and pills. And his glasses and his wallet. And, <laughs> and me. Um, uh, about spatial awareness in, in the car. Unfortunately, the car that I drive and we ride around mostly is very dark inside, so it's it's almost black. Well, most of his items, cell phones, glasses, and things are kind of black too. So they drop on the floor. Then he can't find them, and I have a hard time trying to find them. So I bought a light-colored uh, mat in the car, so it's much easier for him to see. He can't find the, the door handle, because it's all one color. So I put bright-colored rubber bands around the door handle, so he's able to see the door handle and getting out. Um, I always carry wipes, Kleenex, and an eyeglass cloth. I used to think, oh, and extra pills, and the medication list. I used to think, why can't he keep his eyeglasses clean? Oh, okay, it's Parkinson's. Then I realized, no, he never did. <laughs> so sometimes you have to think about, is it really the Parkinson's or is it just your partner? So it's trying to keep things in perspective. Uh, speech is difficult. We're still working on that one. What I suggest is um, Parkinson's Institute, they have the speech therapy. Uh, Randy is wonderful with it. I do suggest that. Uh, Bill did. I, I'm amazed at how he was very proactive in looking for research projects. He found a speech research project that he went to and uh, is wearing a special hearing aid in his ears. Um, it was great. He went back to Chicago about six times on his own. The problem was that the speech aid after a while was one more thing to take with us when we went out. And we, he would lose it. And so it was um, clear color. So it was very hard to find if it fell on the floor. Um, but that was a few years ago, and he's not using that now. But he did, has looked at it. So the two of us communicate about different kinds of ways to solve problems. And one of the ones I've suggested with the speech is when I ask you a yes or no question, please just answer yes or no. Well, that doesn't always work. So we're still trying to sort things out, and that's fine. He, there's a lot he wants to say, but sometimes I just want to know yes or no. But that's something we work with. Again, sense of humor, we need to have sense of humor. He often says he has two speeds, slow and stop. Um, people's responses to Bill. 
I don't know if you've been aware or self-conscious of it, but I've seen some people watching Bill, and it, it angers me. And I, and I just don't like it, you know, little kid, not necessarily little kids, but teenagers, they're staring at him and looking at him, even adults. And so instead of being angry, what I do now is I go up and I say, you know, I noticed that you were looking at my husband. Just so you know, he has Parkinson's, so that's why he looks that way. And they're, oh, oh no, that's okay, we, we, we didn't question it. But I feel good because I called them on it. And two, I educated them on it. You know, as you look at the increased jobs as a caregiver, you need to kind of think about what was it you did prior to the Parkinson's coming in. In our family, I did not do the laundry. I taught my boys, our sons, when they were eight and nine years old to do their own laundry. I won't go into why, but it sure was a lot better. And my husband always did his laundry. Well, now he's at a stage where he needs assistance with the laundry. So that is an added task for me, where somebody else, that may not be an added task because it's something you've always done. So as you're looking as a caregiver, it's important to see what is it that's being added on and how can you get help. So how do I help myself in through all this? I'm still working, I love my work. My husband understands that I love my work. Um, I have talked about getting support in the, in the house to help him as the time goes on. I also know I will not continue to be um, working as a principal in the school. I can't do it forever. And I don't want to. There are other things I want to do. But for me, being a caregiver is not my calling. For some people, it is. When I talk about caregiver, I mean for a full time. And I'm being honest. If I was to be a full-time caregiver, and I've told my husband this, it would kill me. I would no longer be a wife. I would no longer be that friendly person. Even now, there are times that I'm not friendly, and he knows it. I don't want to be like that forever. So I know that. I understand my limitations, and I ask that all of you look at your limitations. I set time for exercise. Um, I read a daily prayer each morning. I get massages. Bill and I set me time, so we'll talk about you go do something for a couple hours, I do something for a couple hours, and then we come back to watch a movie, and we know not to interrupt each other. I like to do gardening, I see my friends, I attend caregiving support meetings, the couple meetings by Brandon when I can get there, and it's been wonderful. I do see a therapist, friends and family, and you're the patient, PD patient, don't always want to hear everything that you, that's bothering you, you need to get, have somebody that is objective and can really listen. And it has been tremendously helpful to me. Also accept getting help. I'm from a family where you never asked for help. You did it all yourself. And now I'm at a point I realize no more. I ask for help. And so we now have a gardener, we just started about two months ago, doing just the front garden. Never had a gardener in all our married life. I did it all myself, my husband did it. Never had a housekeeper. I now have a housekeeper. Just started a month ago. It is so nice just coming home and just seeing it clean. Now, probably when I stop working, I will probably still want to do some of these things because there are other, other goals or tasks that I enjoy more than those things. Um, setting boundaries, for instance, and Bill and I have discussed this, he does do a lot of falling. But I have just shared with him, I cannot try to stop him from falling. If I try to stop him, I could end up injuring myself, and then I will not be there to help him as a caregiver. Then we've got two people that have a problem. So it's that communication again and understanding what does that mean. Simplify around the house as much as possible. Um, and there's, I was thrilled when our pepper tree and nut tree died because it just dropped so much stuff in the backyard, constantly cleaning up. I was thrilled it died. Now I'm secretly hoping that our refrigerator dies. <laughs> because I want the new ones where when it's open, it dings, dings, dings. Because Bill does have a tendency to leave refrigerator doors open. So it would be nice to get one of those that have the alarm. 
Can one still have their dreams? Yes, you just have to adjust them. You can still dream and you can still have your joys in life. Blessings, and I'll end with this statement here. There's much that has changed and I've learned as well as Bill has since he has Parkinson's. Many of it positive. It's futile to ask whether I wish he didn't have Parkinson's, because he has it. Of course, my answer would be yes, even though I've learned more independence, self-reliance, learned more about finances. But then, then again, who knows what challenges we would have had without Parkinson's. Maybe worse things could have happened in our marriage. Daniel, our youngest son, has said that he sees dad as being softer and more understanding since he's had Parkinson's. Bill says he's gained more patience and is a better listener. I say, let's just go to Hawaii <laughs> and enjoy ourselves. Thank you. We have Dr. Melanie Brandeber, who's going to be speaking next. She's the director of our patient clinic. She's been treating Parkinson's disease for many years um, and is going to be talking about the non-motor symptoms of Parkinson's. Thank you for joining us, Dr. Brandeber. Thank you, Maria. And I want to say thank you to uh, Maria and um, Lauren, who organized this, and anyone else that I missed on that? Who's sponsoring? Uh, Teva. Teva. A grant from Teva is sponsoring treats and... And Robin Katsaras with the gifts and, and I think the idea, actually. So um, we'd like to say thank you to all those people and thank you all for coming. Now, this, I don't know if any of you have heard my non-motor and Parkinson's talk before, but I was not given very much time to do this, so I'm going to sort of go through it quickly. The main point of this is not to have an exhaustive discussion about all of these things, but just to make sure that that patients and caregivers in particular know that many of these things can be part of Parkinson's. I think sometimes we focus so much on the tremor or the walking or the motor parts of Parkinson's that we forget to go into some of the non-motor aspects. And so you have um, sort of an outline of this in your handout. It's more of a thing to, to think about, to ask your doctor if per this particular symptom you're seeing could be caused by the Parkinson's or not. The general rule of thumb is if there's something potentially dangerous, you always want to make sure there's not some other cause. Like uh, if the blood pressure is dropping, you might want to make sure there's not a heart rhythm problem or congestive heart failure before you just say, oh, it's the Parkinson's again. So that's the kind of number one consideration with all of these things. So I'm going to do this for about 15 minutes. And then Renee from our clinic, Renee's our scheduler here, is, is we're going to try to sort of tell you about our new electronic medical record system. Um, and the patient portal, which is a way that patients and caregivers can put in information from home and get certain things done um, over the internet without having to necessarily call us or fax us or whatever. So we're just starting this, so if we don't, can't answer all your questions and don't know everything about it, it's because it's kind of new to us too. This is a shift that we've made in the last few weeks. So, All right, so non-motor symptoms of Parkinson's. Um, Parkinson's was described in 1817 by James Parkinson. It's a progressive neurodegenerative disorder caused by degeneration of dopamine neurons. Now, if you read that sentence, you'll figure out that that doesn't really tell you anything, right? It doesn't say why those neurons degenerate, and it does not explain that other neurons besides the dopamine neurons also may degenerate in Parkinson's. So, for example, there's a change in the balance of neurotransmitters such as serotonin and norepinephrine in many patients, that that's, those are not dopamine systems, those are serotonin neurons and norepinephrine neurons, but that may account for some of the mood changes we see in Parkinson's. And then when people have memory problems, there may be a degeneration of acetylcholine neurons, so neurons using acetylcholine as a neurotransmitter, which is, again, a whole different population of neurons. So the simplistic idea that I personally learned in medical school many years ago is very simplistic and does not in any way tell the whole story. The dopamine loss is what accounts for a lot of the motor symptoms, but there are other things going on as well in Parkinson's, and that's kind of the focus of this overview. So the motor symptoms we think about are tremor, slowness, stiffness, and later on, balance impairment. So treatments of motor symptoms would include medications, exercises, a biggie, um, physical therapy, occupational therapy, sometimes surgery, but only for a specific category of patients. And stress management is very important. Uh, the other thing I should have put on here is sleep management, because making sure sleep is tuned up 
is very, very important in having good motor function. So some of the medical therapies for Parkinson's are some of the drugs you might be familiar with. Um, they all have pluses and minuses, and the purpose of this is not to go into a big discussion of medications, but the, these are the medicines we're trying to use to sort of make up for that dopamine loss in the brain. Now, the secondary symptoms, which are also sort of motor, would be the stooped posture, the reduced facial expressiveness, small steps, small handwriting or micrographia, and kind of asymmetry that we see in the beginning. So now, here's the whole slew of non-motor symptoms, and these include things like low blood pressure, skin changes like flaky, uh, sort of a dandruff of the skin, sometimes swallowing difficulties, speech changes, the speech often becomes softer, nausea may develop possibly as a medication side effect, uh, sexual dysfunction, urinary symptoms, temperature regulation dysfunction, cognitive changes, and pain. Now, if somebody's out there has been newly diagnosed or your partner's been newly diagnosed with Parkinson's, don't sit there to yourself and say, oh my gosh, I didn't know all this was coming, because it may not. Not everybody gets all of these things. These are just some of the things that can develop as part of the Parkinson's disease. There's a group of four uh, symptoms that we know can definitely precede the motor symptoms by years or even a decade or more. And so these are the things that we sort of are looking for in uh, studies to see if there's a way to identify what's called premotor Parkinson's disease or Parkinson's before you get that first tremor or slowness of movement or gait disorder or what have you. And these things are depression, uh, sleep disorders, constipation, and anosmia. Anosmia means uh, the loss of ability to smell. Uh, generally food, flowers, things like that. And a lot of patients don't realize that they even have that, uh, or they say, oh, I lost that years ago because I had sinus infections or because, uh, you know, I was in an explosion or because I had a head injury or whatever. But um, a lot of times we, we figure it's probably due to the Parkinson's. So depression, very, very common. Depending on how you ask the question, it's present in up to 90% of patients. Uh, but when you ask most Parkinson's patients if they're depressed, 99% of the time they say no. Um, but if you say, do you still enjoy doing the things you used to like to do, they might say, well, not really because, you know, it's harder for me to do because well, I have Parkinson's, so, so why would I enjoy, you know, I can't do the things I used to do. And a lot of times, in fact, somebody did a study of early Parkinson's disease patients and found that a lot of them rated themselves as being quite disabled from the Parkinson's disease. But in fact, it was more the depression that was causing the disability than the motor symptoms because the motor symptoms at that point were still quite mild. A lot of times family is more aware that the person is depressed than the patient themselves. Um, so we try to ask everybody involved if we can. Uh, usually response to an SSRI such as uh, paroxetine or Lexapro or Celexa or something like that. I've got the, my two ways of treating Parkinson's. One is the ideal way that I would do it if I had unlimited resources and the patients had unlimited resources, which is I would send everybody to a desert island for a few months with their favorite people and they'd get some counseling and some yoga and some massage and all this sort of thing. That's how I would really like to treat depression. But realistically, it doesn't happen that way for most people. So most people get a pill. So, but the pill, the SSRI, the Paxil, Zoloft, Lexapro, whatever, what it does is it seems to sort of correct that imbalance in the brain between the serotonin and the norepinephrine and to some extent the dopamine so that what happens is that if, if it's successful, which it is most of the time, is that the person feels more like themselves or the spouse will say, oh, thanks for giving me my wife back or whatever. So that's the goal. It's not to make people abnormally happy. Um, it's to make people sort of more like themselves. So if you were grumpy before, you're going to be grumpy. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> usually, that's, usually it makes people less grumpy. Uh, sleep disturbance. Sleep disturbance is a huge, huge subject in Parkinson's disease. And the one thing I will emphasize to you as caregivers in particular is when you go to the doctor and say this person's having trouble sleeping or I'm having trouble sleeping, don't just go in and say that because you will automatically get put on a sleeping pill. And a lot of times, there is something else going on with the sleep that needs to be fixed. For example, if the medication, if the Parkinson's medication wears off in the middle of the night, the person may wake up with a tremor or may be stiff and slow and unable to position themselves in bed or turn over or get up to use the bathroom or any of those things. Um, or the medication can wear off and leave the person with sort of drenching night sweats. And they think, like I had one lady who was 80 call up and say, 
I'm getting sweats during the night. Do you think it could be the menopause? I said, not at 80, I don't think. So what was happening is that her levodopa was wearing off. Whatever she took at bedtime was gone at, by 2 in the morning, and then she was had drenching sweats, and I've had people who were empty nesters kind of go from bed to bed in their house to find a dry bed, and by, by the morning they had to change all the sheets in the whole house, you know. So um, usually adjusting the medication so it's lasting through the night or taking a dose when you get up and so forth will fix that problem. Now, RAM behavior disorder is another one. RAM behavior disorder is when people act out their dreams in the middle of the night. We're not supposed to do this. We're supposed to be paralyzed so that we don't hurt ourselves or the person sleeping next to us. But for some reason, in Parkinson's disease, and again, these are symptoms that may precede the motor symptoms by up to a decade or more, people, for some reason, are able to move around when they're having their dreams. And this can be very dangerous. I've had people jump out of bed, land on their heads. I've had people punch, attempt to strangle, and even bite a spouse. Um, I've had people, one guy told me the other day, he. During the course of this dream, he leapt out of bed onto his arms and dislocated his shoulder. So this can be very, very serious. Very commonly, people come in and they've got a, a kind of a divot out of their temple because they hit the bedside table. So there are some very simple things you can do about this, like to make it safer, put a railing just on the head side of the bed. You can get them that slips under the mattress. Move the bedside table away. Um, get a round bedside table so it's not so pokey and so forth. There are other medications you can use to treat this. However, a lot of Parkinson's patients also will have obstructive sleep apnea. So if somebody's doing one of those things where they're lying in bed and they go, and you're going, honey, honey, take a breath, you know, and, and then they finally let out and, you know, and gasp for air, that means that they are not taking uh, oxygen into their lungs and their oxygen level can drop and it's very, very dangerous. And so the last thing you want to do to someone like that is give them a medication that's sedating, which is what we would give for REM behavior disorder. So those pa patient, patients where I get a history like that, where there's the snoring and obstructing and the REM behavior disorder, are going to have to go to see a sleep doctor to get a sleep study to find out if their oxygen level is dropping at night. If their oxygen level is dropping at night, they will have to wear a CPAP mask, which is a giant pain in the neck and everybody hates them. So um, it's really important to figure out a way to wear them because um, if your oxygen level drops in addition to your motor function being terrible the next day, you're also putting yourself at risk for uh, strokes and heart attacks and other diseases, pulmonary hypertension, all kinds of nasty stuff that you don't need on top of the Parkinson's. So you really have to get that treated. Once the CPAP thing is working, then we can give a medication that's mildly sedating to try to decrease the nighttime activity. But it's very complex. The reason it's so important to treat sleep is that patients with Parkinson's notoriously have good and bad days. The one thing that they tell me over the years is that will predict a bad day is poor sleep the night before. So the two things you have control over that predict a bad day are sleep and stress. And stress we have some control over but not total. So you really have to work on, on tidying up the sleep. So it's effective sleep where you go through all the stages, you're getting oxygen, etc. Depression is also a very common cause of a sleep disorder. People wake up in the night and start worrying and ruminating about this, that, and the other things, sometimes things that aren't even important. And that goes back to sort of an anxiety thing that's tied in with the depression. So that usually gets better when you treat the, the mood and the serotonin, norepinephrine thing. Um, periodic leg movements of sleep is another one. That also responds to clonazepam, which is the sedating medication. Restless leg syndrome in people with Parkinson's disease usually is because they don't have enough dopaminergic medication on board. So if people say that you took your last Cinemat at 6 o'clock, now it's 11 o'clock, you're trying to settle down and go to sleep, that medication is out of your system now, and now your brain doesn't have enough uh, dopamine on board, and people start to have that squirmy feeling like they need to uh, wiggle their legs around. So that's also treated by adjusting the medicine so you get some at bedtime. So you can see that it's really important when you go into the doctor with this sleep complaint to know what it is that you're dealing with. The more you can tell your doctor about what's happening, the less likely you are to just get a Band-Aid sleeping pill put on it, which actually in some people can make it worse. Sleeping pills and benzodiazepines, like the clonazepam, are always top of the list when it comes to causes of falls, like in studies they've done in nursing homes. They're either you know, one or two, sometimes they switch, but, but falls in older people, sleeping pills, 
and drugs like Ativan, Xanax, et cetera, are always on the top two. That's why it's better if, you know, people don't like the idea of taking an antidepressant, but if you have this Parkinson's sort of anxiety thing, better off taking something like Lexapro or, or Paxil or Celexa because that will treat the anxiety without making you dopey. If you just get Xanax once in a while, that can make you a little dopey, confused, wobbly on your feet, all things that somebody with Parkinson's does not need. Constipation. Oh, time's up. No. <laughs> Neurologists went into neurology because it's a clean profession where we don't have to talk about bowel movements. So now that I take care of people with Parkinson's, I have to talk about it every single day of my life because it's caused by the Parkinson's. The gut gets Parkinson's, so everything going through there slows down. And so we have a whole sheet we hand you in the clinic, that fruit, fiber, flaxseed, all of it's fine, whatever works for you. But a lot of people at the end of the day will end up taking uh, some kind of um, anti-constipation medicine, and far and away, the one that's been best over the years is Miralax, which is also called propylene glycol. I didn't used to like to say the generic name because it's very close to ethylene glycol, and I was afraid I'd accidentally tell people to take antifreeze for their constipation. <laughs> antifreeze is poison, and so I'm not recommending that. So the anosmia is the, the last lack of, lack of sense of smell. Now, interestingly, I'm always harping at my patients about exercise, and there have been a couple of reports that um, vigorous exercise in Parkinson's patients has improved the sense of smell. So it's not definitive, it's not controlled studies, but it's very interesting and another good reason why people should exercise. And the exercise goes for caregivers as well as people with Parkinson's. Um, some people with Parkinson's will complain that they don't, they don't t food doesn't taste good to them, um, and this may be why. The sense of smell is very important to the sense of uh, taste. Uh, more no uh, non-motor Parkinson's, again, those four were the ones that can precede the motor symptoms. Some of the ones I'm going to tell you about can as well, but they're not as, as well, well recognized in that way. So cognitive dysfunction. Cognitive dysfunction does not mean dementia. It means... The things that our brain does every day with language, memory, recognizing people, planning, executing, etc. So it's a lot, whole constellation of different functions of our, the thinking part of our brain. And people with Parkinson's do tend to have difficulty with certain aspects of cognition. Now, does this mean everybody with Parkinson's is going to become demented? No, it does not. Um, but early on, people may have difficulty with things like planning, multitasking, and so forth. And it's good for caregivers to know this because this can help you be maybe a little more patient with the person with Parkinson's because they may not be able to plan and carry out the things in the same way they used to. They may need more uh, quiet, more a separate room set aside for them to do these tasks. It does not mean that they are not able to balance a checkbook in terms of the simple math involved, but it may mean that they can't do it with the TV on and the dog barking and the kids running around. So I think this is, if you've got to have some cognitive change, this is a more manageable kind than the kind, you know, that you get in Alzheimer's, which tends to be more profound and involves difficulty storing memory, um, whereas Parkinson's is more difficulty retrieving it. But when you're talking to your caregiver, you need to think about things like you know, when, patient, when spouses say to me, well, he's, his memory is poor. He doesn't remember what I tell him. And I say, well, how did you tell him? Did you shout it in from the kitchen while he was watching the game on TV and playing with the grandchildren? Well, then there's a good chance he's not going to remember it. If, did you come in, get eye contact? I always think of my teenager when I talk about this because with my teenager, he'll be watching a movie, playing a video game, thinking about some song he wants to write for his guitar. So if I say, honey, we're going to go to a movie on Friday, the next day he's like, you never told me. But what you have to do is you have to go in there and you have to look at them and say, Andrew, Andrew, are you, are you seeing me? You have to make eye contact and make sure they don't have that glazed look over their eyes because they're teenagers and they have that a lot. And then you say, we're going to a movie tomorrow night. And then he usually says, wait, what? And then I say, you and me, we're going to move. So then the communication is made. So don't shout it in from the other room. When your spouse is doing something complex, like working on his car or something like that, don't expect them to hear what you say. They cannot multitask as well. Now, actually, Stanford did a really depressing study a couple of years ago that shows that not only do we not really multitask, it's a myth, we are really shifting our attention from one thing to the other, but those of us who think we're multitasking, like myself, are doing a bad job. 
So, <laughs> so none of us really should be multitasking. But people with Parkinson's often particularly have a difficulty. So you can, if you can understand that, sort of let them do one thing at a time. Be mindful that if, they're, if everybody's around the dinner table and there are four or five conversations going on and you say, we're having dinner with the Joneses tomorrow, it may not get in there. Don't, don't pick that moment to, import, you know, to, to say something important that you expect them to remember. If they're doing something that's hard for them, like walking up a flight of stairs where they really have to concentrate on not falling down the stairs, that's not a good time to say, where should we go for our vacation this year? I thought we could take the grandchildren on a cruise. You know, it's not a good time. You know, Mar Mar Marilyn, our physical therapist, says walk, then talk. So that's a very important thing to remember. Hallucinations may occur. They don't always. Um, we watch for clues because we like to nip them in the bud. If somebody starts saying, oh, I thought I saw a cat, but we don't have a cat, then that's something you want to tell the doctor next time you're in there because that might mean that they're starting to get some visual stuff as a side effect of some of their medication. And we do have ways of treating this. Now, we actually have a study we're doing um, that, of a medicine that looks very promising for that. So, um, but the doctor needs to know that because it can get really out of hand, and then you can get paranoia, hypersexuality, agitation, that kind of thing. We don't want to wait until it gets to that point, and neither do you, because it can get really out of hand. Again, most people don't get to this point, but some people do, and we like to nip it in the bud early. Speech dysfunction, very, very common. Soft voice, hoarse voice. This can be a real problem because of isolation. If you're not able to communicate, you're going to feel isolated from your partner, and there, the person with Parkinson's is going to gradually get isolated from the rest of the world. We want to make sure and get the speech dysfunction treated early. We like the Lee Silverman voice therapy, which we do here, but there are therapists trained all over the state um, to do this therapy. Very important that they continue to do the exercises and that they work, work, work on this so that they don't become isolated and any uh, uh, communication dysfunction between a caregiver couple is not accentuated by this. Swallowing difficulties, uh, not a major problem in early Parkinson's, but can become difficult later on. Some of it is simple. Have trouble taking the pills, take it with pudding or applesauce or something like that. Some of the medications can be given as liquid. Um, so these are, so there's some things you can do. The Lee Silverman treatment helps with swallowing as well. Low blood pressure. This can be a real problem in Parkinson's. Somebody in the clinic, their blood pressure day was like 179 over... 68 or something, and they said, are you worried about that high blood pressure? And I said, no, I'm actually not bothered by it at all because I'm worried when people come in and they stand up and we measure their blood pressure and it goes down to 80 over 40 because that's the kind of blood pressure where people start fainting. And if you faint, you fall, and you can break a hip, and that's going to really make everything worse with your Parkinson's. Um, so a lot of patients with high blood pressure that have been on medicine for years may, with the help of their cardiologist, wean that off over time. I always joke that Parkinson's is one of the few things that can cure high blood pressure. Not really curing anything, you're just replacing one problem with another. But when people have always had low blood pressure and their blood pressure starts to go down, that can be really serious. You have to keep up your fluids and salt intake and that sort of thing. Skin changes, I mentioned. Um, very rare to get an allergy from the Parkinson's medication. Sometimes, rarely, people are allergic to the yellow dye in the Cinemet. People can get at this sort of dandruff of the skin that can be treated by a dermatologist. Dandruff shampoo is sometimes helpful. Sexual function, this is a big area where when I graduated and you know, started seeing patients on my own, I tried to be really proactive and bring sexual function up to couples, and it became clear that some people didn't want to talk about it. So I don't bring it up as often as I used to, but if there's an issue with sexual function, either at a cognitive level where the two of you need some counseling to deal with what your relationship is going to be now, or at the plumbing level where you need a consult to a urologist or maybe some medication, be sure and bring that up to your doctor. Delayed gastric emptying. This, everything in the gut slows down, remember I told you? Sometimes people lose weight because they cannot eat the same amount as a meal as they used to without feeling like they're, they just had Thanksgiving dinner. So if this is what's happening, the person may need to eat five or six small meals a day. And if there's no earthly, really important reason why not, it's time to throw out the low-fat yogurt and the low-fat milk. This person needs full-fat Greek yogurt. First of all, it tastes better. Um, but, the, but you're trying to get high-quality calories in. It's not the time to go eat 15 Big Macs a day. It's a time to, you know, put some good 
you know, full fat yogurt or some good ice cream with your fruit. Um, and that's something you can, may need to see a nutritionist for. Uh, the delayed ga gastric emptying may also cause unpredictable absorption of medications. So it's another th reason why the medicine sometimes doesn't work as predictably. Don't ever take metoclopramide or Reglan because that blocks dopamine receptors in the brain and it can make Parkinson's worse. Some old-fashioned doctors still use that stuff. I don't know why, but it's really not good for Parkinson's patient. Nausea can be caused by, sometimes by the medication, uh, sometimes by the de delayed gastric emptying. And I think that's it. Oh, I got through that in record time. So I'm going to have Renee talk to you about the patient portal a little bit. And then if you have, a specific, if you have qu general questions, you can grab me afterwards. I cannot answer specific questions about you or your medication or whatever, even if you're my patient, because I won't remember what you're taking. Um, but So we can make a clinic visit, and we can discuss that in clinic or call our nurse. Um, so Renee's going to talk about the patient portal, and I will learn about this too. <laughs> Hi everyone, my name is Renee and I work down in the clinic. Um, one of the things I do, I'm sure I've talked to some of you, is I do all the new patients. About three weeks ago, we implemented our new electronic medical record system. This is the patient portal. This allows our patients to log in and do a lot of cool stuff. Okay, so there we are. And we are working on it. There are a few bugs. Like I said, we just started this a couple of weeks ago and we did notice the Thing today where it's saying that you're not a patient or you're not web enabled they're working on it for us now so some of the things you can do is you can message into clinic staff um, and do a variety of things you can check your medical records online now you can send a general message um, hey you changed my medicine I don't feel too good what should I do clinic staff will get back to you you can request refill on your prescriptions. Yes. Sorry about that. Can you hear me now? Okay. Um, so again, just touching some of the things you can do is send a message to our clinic staff um, requesting refills on medication. Um, hey doc, you changed my medication. I don't feel too good. What should I do? Kind of thing. You can check future and past appointments. You can request an appointment, a non-urgent routine follow-up. You can email us and say, here's when I'll be available. Can you fit me on the schedule? Um, you can look at your statement. If you have a question about your bill, it will now be available online. Of course, this is a test patient. There's not a whole lot of information in here to show you, unfortunately. Um, if you move, you can change your information, add your new phone number, new address, so that we know how to get a hold of you. If you change your email address, let us know. Once we get your email and respond, you're going to get an email message back at your Yahoo account saying you have a new message in the portal and you log in and check it from there. All of this is secure and it's only addressed by clinic staff. Um, if you have surgery after you're here, uh, you can update that for us and let us know online. What it'll do is then populate into your notes. The next time you're here to see Dr. Brandenburg, she's going to go, oh, wait a minute, you had surgery. How'd it go? We're going to know that automatically now. So this is great. Again, you'll have a medical summary. So when you leave here and go, what did she tell me to take? I don't remember. You can log in and look because she's going to indicate it in her note to you. Okay? So for any current patients, if you're interested in being web-enabled, we have a sign-up sheet here. You can sign up and we'll web enable you. If you're not a patient, become our patient and then I will web enable you. Any questions? Okay. All right, thank you, Renee. Um, I think it's very exciting that we're being able to uh, have electronic medical records. It should make everything in the end a lot easier for patients to be able to transfer information between multiple sets of doctors um, and not actually have to photocopy um, copies of your medical record. Next up we have Janine Pratt who's going to be talking to us. She is talking about care for the caregiver. She uh, is with Pathways and has a master's um, in geriology and she's the community outreach coordinator. Pathways is a home health hospice and private duty hospice foundation. So please join me in welcoming Janine Pratt. Thank you Maria. 
And thank you to the Parkinson's Institute for providing this uh, valuable venue for um, the clients and the, most importantly to the caregivers. And I want to say I follow quite an esteemed group because my talk won't need to be that long because they shared so much with you that I brought and you have in your handouts. I want to again thank the Parkinson's Institute and Brandon for his credo for caregivers. That's um, also a part of the handout. And Christina for her resources and also uh, talking about early planning, getting the resources, finding out what's available to you so you are prepared as time goes on and the condition um, advances. Also to uh, the Parkinson's Institute and Dr. Branda Burr for their education. Education is huge, not only for yourselves, but for your families and your loved ones who are not living with you day by day to understand what you're both going through. Uh, and also the support in the community as well as here at the Parkinson's Institute. And thank Renee for uh, making you aware of the access. So many people are on the internet now, and as you may know, when you're making those calls to your medical providers, isn't it great? You can just get online and you have access. And also I want to thank uh, Bill and Vivian Franklin for sharing their path, their journey, and how they've navigated through the last 25 years. I say navigated because it's like a ship. And it, as it goes through the ocean, it kind of yaws this way, and you just work to keeping a, a balance in your lives. And also for sharing their love. If you look at the Pathways logo, it is a heart. And that's what we're all about, is the heart and the love as we go through this process. The first handout is the care for the caregivers. And it covers a lot that Brendan talked about with your health eating for your health, your needs, and refreshing your spirit. Taking those times out. Vivian shared a lot of their um, experiences and how they uh, managed through the time. Uh, also, I wanted to bring up a topic that wasn't um, spoken to directly, and that has to do with respite. Respite for the caregiver. Taking those times out, whether it's five minutes or 10 minutes where you can just go outside, take a deep breath, or sit down and read a book, maybe listen to a nice meditative CD while your loved one is, is taking a rest. Um, and keep a journal. You know, I find that going through trying times, if you keep a journal, keep a little book, it's kind of your connection to your own path. Sometimes you kind of get lost in what's been happening and you can go back and say, oh, 